Who's protecting Ontario's oldest trees? Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. I want to have a conversation today about the question, who's taking care of these old trees, these Ontario old growth trees? Well, I hope somebody is, and these folks know their way around. A new friend of mine is Dolph Winia, a very eminent retired forester with a great interest in the conservation of trees who lives up by Lake Erie. And then here in Toronto are two other friends, Eric Davies, who, who has, he, he tells me that he's planted, I think you said tens of thousands of trees. Uh, and then uh, John Bacher is a very old friend of mine who is uh, working on land preservation in Ontario and especially uh, is devoted to protecting forests. So Dolph, what, what do you have to say about the history of the protection of forests in Ontario? The native people protected their environment quite effectively because they didn't do very much about it, but they did play a role, particularly around here, uh, that they, they burned the country in order to, uh, to, get, uh, to get land and also uh, the regeneration of the forest was, was their source of firewood because they didn't have the means of, of hacking down uh, trees that were two, two feet in diameter, which are the kind of trees that we think of when we talk about old trees. But uh, in, You mean in what one, did they do, hack off limbs and branches of oh, trees? Hack, they, they didn't have, they had stone tools so they couldn't cut trees down, so they had to use natural ways of getting new growth so that the trees would be smaller and that they could use them. Um, but that's just, just one s small aspect. Most of the, the influence of that, of course, is long gone with our white settlers coming in and clearing the land, or most of it, and, uh, but leaving some places where uh, they did not disturb the forest because usually it was too hard for them to get in or even for them to cut down the big trees. But uh, <clears throat> when I think of, of old trees, I, I, I think even more of their surroundings than, than of the trees themselves, because very few of the, the, the trees of our, our native forest would stand by themselves and, and grow to a large size. There are some species, but as soon as you think about old healthy trees, particularly, you think about the, the subject of ecology and, and, and the surroundings. And I think in, in uh, recent years, we've had a, a lot of new research come online that uh, has explained how and why uh, some trees can grow old and wise, if you like, and, and others don't, because there is an interaction of, particularly of fungi, that we certainly, when I went to school, were not aware of, certainly the, the mechanics of it, um, that there has well, to be... Excuse a, me, let me, let me ask a little about that. Are you saying that some... Uh, uh, it, uh, individual trees of the, uh, whatever the species may be, there's a lot of variation in terms of how old they live, or are you saying certain species of trees are going to live uh, longer than others? Uh, yes, the latter. So um, certain we species. Our, our, we have our pioneer species, particularly up in northern Ontario, after a forest fire, certain certain species will move in easily. <laughs> And, and the lake, a birch, poplar and birch, and then over time, other trees will move in as well underneath those trees and eventually replace the original stand of, of, of pioneer species. This is a, a very uh, basic principle of certainly northern uh, Ontario forestry. Now, I'm uh, sorry, let's see, you're saying that poplar and birch are going to be the easiest ones to get get hold in the first place. Is that yes. it? Yes. Uh, and and then uh, uh, why is that? Or is, there, do you, is that known why that's the case? Well, it's, well, it's almost like well, some people are blue eyed and some are, 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 are not. They are specifically adapted to the situation of fire. Mm -hmm. And um, the, 
<coughs> they will not grow uh, easily in competition with other species. Mm -hmm. um, other species are, are designed to grow up underneath a canopy of uh, uh, birch or poplar. Uh, spruce is one, white spruce. Balsam fir is a good competitor underneath even uh, white spruce. So there's a sequence uh, that, that takes place in the natural situation after a fire. Uh, we don't have that in southern Ontario, where the trees fight for their own place really more. And uh, some trees are more effective at doing that than others. And eventually they come to dominate. And in southern Ontario, it's the, the sugar maple that, and beech that becomes, uh, comes to dominate our forest. We leave it alone. I've been told that the Norway maple is like an invasive species. Yes. That people have planted them here and they don't really belong. And some people think oh. they should get rid of them or something. What's, what's the story about the Norway maple? There's a ravine in Leeside that I saw was uh, entirely dominated by Norway maple. But what was interesting is that I saw a photograph of that earlier in the early 1950s and the site was severely disturbed it was just a landfill that was dumped by a contractor that seemed like the Norway maple is the only thing that could survive there so that in urban areas of ecological degradation has been a component of the you know vigor of the Norway maple taking over areas that the, the worst places I've, I've found is these uh, abused ravines where uh, we're, we're treated almost like garbage dumps. Hmm. Well, but the, gar the garbage dumps are doing very well as far as old growth is concerned. As I read uh, Eric Davies' uh, map, Eric's map shows the various species of trees, and you can see where they're concentrated in certain ravines throughout the city. He says there are about a thousand different uh, old trees that are located in these uh, city ravines. Oh. I'd like to ask a, a Sorry. question to Eric. I, I think he maybe confirmed that, you know, the ravines that tend to be dominated by Norway maple and, you know, my experience, you know, Toronto environments, they tend to be ravines that have been really, uh, you know, abused more than other ravines in the city. There's such a dynamic history of land use uh, anywhere in the world that has old uh, human settlements and the, you know, the ravines being right in downtown Toronto uh, certainly have a, a really long history of intensive use of farming and growing back and this and that. And um, there's there, there's that. And then there's also the trees that we've, we've chosen to plant. You know, Norway maple is the most popular urban tree that's that's being planted in Toronto and many other parts in eastern North America. So if you look at the trees that the city of Toronto has planted on the streets that are above the ravines, the dominant tree on city streets is Norway maple. Mm -hmm. You know, 50% of urban trees in a lot of areas that were planted were Norway. So then those seeds fall down into the ravines. And, uh, you know, it's kind of an incidental byproduct, an unintentional byproduct of, of the legacy of uh, tree planting choices that have been primarily about providing quick shade without much thought to providing habitat for biodiversity. You say you found, uh, you know, of a, a, about a thousand trees in Toronto, old trees in Toronto's ravines. How old are these and what are they mostly? What types of trees are they? Yeah, so there, there's thousands of old growth trees in the ravines and you'll find a lot of them in you know, front yards and backyards. Uh, and then also in the areas, the green areas like the ravines. So as Dolph was saying that, the forest type of, of this part of Ontario, Great Lakes, St. Lawrence, Lowlands is, you know, the climax forest will be maple and beech. And then you'll have other common trees like the oaks, red oak, white oak. Um, you get a lot of maples and oaks. You know, of course, we've lost the chestnut. We've just lost. We're losing the ash. We're losing the beech. So uh, sugar we're maple. We're losing all these. Are these because of the disease? 
Largely, yeah. Uh, diseases from other continents that are often imported on, on nursery stock. Like, again, another incidental kind of byproduct of, of the aesthetic uh, drive for landscaping. Don't you have medicines for trees? You know, it's, it's kind of like COVID. It's not that simple. A lot of diseases that uh, attack trees are evolutionary diseases that the, in, the, in the continents they came from, the species there have a long co-evolutionary history that uh, produces genetic resistance to them. However, with the chestnut blade, you know, coming over, uh, it encounters the American chestnut that doesn't have resistance. So the, the, the time it takes to evolve resistance is evolutionary time. Right, thousands of years. So things like the emerald ash borer. There's a there's an, a beetle that came over, and the ashes don't have time to to respond. Although they are finding that uh, there is genetic resistance to emerald ash borer, beech bark disease, perhaps American chestnut. There, there's there's often low incidences of genetic resistance of populations. Well, is there any way of setting up a, a screening process so that when people come in, uh, I remember I used to live in California, and if I'd go out of the state, I, every time I'd drive back in, they'd stop me at the border, and they'd ask me what food I had. And if I had an orange or something, they'd make me throw it away because they didn't want anybody coming in with certain certain types of food that might be uh, contaminated and might have uh, bacteria or germs that could infect the the California um, yeah, uh, agriculture. Yeah, uh, there, there's a long history of screening in Ontario. Also, there's a long history of dealing with these diseases. The white pine blister was was a early example of uh, imported disease but this is something that really happened hit ontario in the first world war it is sort of now under control one of the things that foresters did that they found the gooseberry was a other similar berries were a, a host to this disease and they had them removed but these things take time Another thing that was done because of this problem of uh, uh, Edmund Zavitz, who I wrote a biography of, he created the Ontario Seed Tree Plant. And that was so we wouldn't have to import trees into Ontario, that we could do reforestation from native stock. And uh, what is very sad about how we're not learning the uh, lessons of the past is that this facility was closed down by the Ontario government and it may become a, a cannabis nursery. Oh, for the love of Pete, just what we need. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sort of Ontario conservation has literally gone to pot. <laughs> Oh, they, that's a sad story. Williams Nursery, which was the first nursery in the province of Ontario, is now about half of the space in it is dedicated to the growing of cannabis. Is that right? And the rest of the nursery, uh, I don't know what they're doing now, but it's certainly not as significant as it used to be. And it's all privatized. So well, no you know, they, <laughs> they promised a, a couple of years ago that they were going to plant... I think uh, Trudeau promised to plant 2 billion trees in yes. Canada. Uh, well, if he's going to plant 2 billion trees, they better get busy with some nurseries well, raising the, the baby trees, the saplings, right? This is the uh, point I'm eager to make is that of all the nurseries that Zavitz created, there was only one that really continues in that role today. That is the uh, Howard Ferguson uh, uh, station. All the others, as Dolph just pointed out, have, have gone to pot. The, um, the thing that uh, this seed tree plant, Trudeau's two billion tree, two billion 
treat program mm -hmm. would have not existed had it not been for the vigorous determination of the people that run this nursery. Mm -hmm. The Ontario government closed down their reforestation program and the Howard Ferguson, they must have someone there who's good with PR because they were going to have a dramatic destruction of, of the, the trees they had grown because they were, would have no use. And with that uh, lobbying, they got the federal government to essentially rescue them. Mm -hmm. And the, the, <laughs> it, it seems that's the main impact of the two billion tree program is to keep what they're doing at the Howard Ferguson uh, station going. It's a, a nonprofit foundation and the land is owned by a municipal government. And uh, it, I mean, it, it, it seems that the, when the two billion tree program was announced, they were going to expand the program throughout on throughout Canada instead of just picking up what Ontario government had been doing. And it, it seems that we're getting like these endless consultations and we're not, you know, getting anything, you know, more to really add to the program other than what the Ontario government was doing. Where is this Ferguson nursery? It's in the municipality called Kempville, which is uh, south of uh, Ottawa. Mm -hmm. It really has a, a wonderful history. It was the nursery station that Zavitz created for Eastern Ontario. Uh, there's a remarkable forest near there, the La Rose Forest, which was a desert wasteland. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of the uh, uh, biggest forests in, in, in the world to have been, uh, you know, really been created through uh, human intervention. They pla he planted all, or right? He had them all planted, right? The, the nursery did. It was, uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> it was under legislation that he and his friend D.C. Drury uh, developed for what's called the uh, Agreement Forest Program with cooperation with uh, county governments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, now, do you s see that there is going to be really, I mean, will they really be planting two billion trees? Or are they, is this just all talk? And if they are going to do it, are they, are they starting? Uh, what's the work? Uh, uh, what's the game plan? Well, the, the, the start is that the Ontario government under the uh, Dalton McGuinty was the premier, created a, a, I think it was called, I may not have the exact name, I, I, I invite other gentlemen to, to butt in if I'm wrong, it's, I think it was called the 30 Million Tree Program. And that was to be created over a very long time. And they had maybe got about, I think, about 20 million planet. And the Ford was going to terminate. Mm -hmm. And because of the good PR that the Howard Ferguson Center did, that work is now being done by the federal government. Mm -hmm. But during not this election, but the previous election, uh, the, the Prime Minister came up with the idea of the $2 billion tree program. I certainly love the title because the same title is my book. But we, they're essentially negotiating and doing these sort of endless consultations with various partners to, you know, go beyond the, the, uh, program that Dalton McGinty created for Ontario. We have John talking about Edmund Zabitz, you know, real pioneer conservation in Ontario. And, uh, um, you know, Dolph Winia, um, again, running the St. Williams Nursery. We've had a long history of, of tremendous stewardship efforts in Ontario that really at the core are about educating people about how to be good stewards. And um, we have this idea 
this important idea of shifting baselines so over time, of course, nature declines and we don't really recognize it. However, th this knowledge is also declining. You know, um, if you look at the era when Dolph was running St. William's Nursery, it was kind of like the heyday of the Ministry of Natural Resources. And they had a tremendous amount of uh, great educational programs. They planted the pine plantations. And when there was, when the Ministry of Natural Resources was heavily cut in the 90s, there was a real... Uh, you know, decline in education. And so when you look at the forest that Edmund Zavitz planted and even St. Williams being the oldest one in Ontario and other ones like that, um, you need to continue stewardship. And uh, so it's a lot more about planting millions and billions of trees. It's really about maintaining um, ecological consciousness and literacy amongst the population so we can carry this great work forward and we don't have to continuously reinvent the wheel uh with newer generations like if we could have continued on the great work um of our previous generation i think we'd be a lot further ahead I, I, if if i may I, I i'd like to just comment on it in my experience i i started the uh, my work in uh, in thunder bay actually and at that time so that would have been around the 60s and 70s. There was great cooperation between the provincial government, which was was conservative, and the federal government, which, which was liberal. And most of the expenses that I incurred developing that nursery from about, uh, I think it was 4 million uh, trees per year to the last shipment I made was five, 50, 50 million trees. Uh, was a joint effort by provincial and federal governments. And I'm hoping that the statement uh, by Trudeau with his two billion trees is going to go the same way. But the, the uh, federal government pulled out of the agreement and the, the provincial government eventually gave up as well. And that's where we are now with no provincial nurseries to even think about starting to uh, plant two billion trees across Canada. Now, don't forget in British Columbia, there is, uh, there is already a very active growing uh, industry. And the, the new reforestation methods are quite a bit different from the ones that Zavitz developed. Uh, we are now growing trees in, in containerized um, facilities or containerized um, uh, units that can be machine planted. And we might even go to uh, aerial planting with, uh, with our, 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 uh, the, the new developments with these uh, drones. That's amazing, the, the uh, technology that is being developed. We, we can do these things, but we're going to have to put some money into it. And it really should be a cooperative effort between various governments, because otherwise there is no sustainability or permanency to any of these efforts. Okay, now you've raised, uh, raised a very interesting question about drones and planting that way. I got very interested in that a couple of years ago. And in fact, Eric was on one of my shows when I... Uh, tried to interview some people in Britain who uh, have a company that do, does this drone planting. And uh, Eric and uh, Sandy Smith, uh, the, who was then the dean of the forestry school at U of T, uh, were, sounded uh, a little bit pessimistic about this at the time. When I was out there, hurrah, hurrah, hurrah for them, you know, I was extremely th enthusiastic, but they were more cautious and since then, I've become a little bit more cautious. And I, I, I don't really have any basis for it because I keep trying to interview companies that will let me talk to them about the drone planting uh, operations they're doing. And nobody will ever return my phone calls. I think they have a proprietary sense of not wanting to share their information or something. But for some reason, I can't find uh, adequate information about how effective this system really is. Do, do any of you really know, uh, it's been about two years since Eric and I had that one talk show, uh, do either uh, any of you have any more up-to-date information about how successful various drone planting operations are, really are? Well, I just would like to point out that we've had aerial seeding for um, 
it's Jack Pine in the North for a long time. Yeah, but that's not the same, John. These, these drone planting things, what they have is a, a pod, a plastic or something kind of pod, which is full with gelatins of nutrients huh. and the seed in there. And they, they put these in a, in a machine that shoots them into the ground so that it actually plants the, the thing. Now, I, I, my impression from almost no evidence is that it works pretty well for mangrove planting because you can s s sort of shoot it into the shallow part of the, the water and the, the plants will come up and do fine. But that it that hadn't done so well in some of these other, um, I don't want to call them experiments, but uh, because they're actually being plant, you know, they're being paid to do this on a big scale. But it's not just the same as dropping seeds out of a plane. That's right. Well, one, yeah. It seems that one way to, the, the, one was to experiment with the, the um, um, jack pine would, would get better results with the drone than, you know, with the plane. Yeah. I haven't seen any results of that work, but it, it looked pretty promising, and it, and it was done in, on the appropriate site in northern Alberta, uh, which, of course, is not comparable to anything that we have here in southern Ontario. But uh, I, I haven't heard of any, anything since that uh, either, what the success was. But uh, the interesting thing is that the technology is that you can actually plant those, those germinating seeds and then go back and fertilize them later and even uh, apply some, uh, some herbicides to make sure that they survive. However, uh, strictly speculative, uh, but it has some potential. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I want to build on what Doug, uh, Dolph said about the problem of partisanship. That at one time in Canada, we had a sort of consensus about for all political parties what good forestry was and one sign of the, the breakdown of this the uh harper government closed the uh forestry station at indian head yeah and this operation was i think the first time in the country where you had a professional forester had a full-time job and it very distinguished history, and it it's a you know very struggling nonprofit. And one thing that the Trudeau government, just by assisting this nonprofit in uh, Indian Head Nursery, would be a, a you know practical way to get this program going at a national level. Well, do, do any of you, uh, are you familiar with the, the bureaucracy that's charged with the responsibility of making these two big trees happen? Or uh, it, I, I'm just curious, I haven't heard any more about it, and I just wonder if it's really going to happen. Seems to me, if you're going to plant two billion trees, you better get going because at least put the seeds in the ground and get them started because it takes so long, you know? You know, but they take um, years in an, in an average nursery for seedling for uh, rooted stock. Uh, these uh, containerized units they they can be grown in one year. So you you put a seed in in a can or something, and a year later you can take it in, uh, out in a, and put it in the in in the ground out where you want it to grow. Huh? Yeah. Uh, is that true for all trees, or uh, what's special about this new technology? Well, it's not new anymore. It's about 25 years old. The containerized unit, it was developed in, uh, well, in, in Alberta, the, it started, and then Ontario did a lot of it. And, uh, well, I think I might have had something to do with it up in Thunder Bay, which is the leading uh, location with uh, Lakehead University. But, <clears throat> Okay, so these are just like a tin can or something you put them in, is that right? Oh, it's, it's plastic. Yeah. We started with plastic tubes. They looked like cigarette tube, cigarettes. They were a white plastic tube, and it would expand as the tree would grow. 
Well, the problem with them was that they would they would heave right out of the ground in the first winter, because if you put a stick in the ground, it, it will heave with thawing and freezing. And we had to learn that. So then we went to uh, different units, and we had paper pots, and they had some had a lot of advantages, some disadvantages, and. Uh, and then we also had some that had no pots at all, but just the roots themselves held held the soil, and they 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 did quite well, mm-hmm. and they still exist. Okay. Uh, now I've heard that that some people put um, tubes around the base of the tree uh, because animals will eat them otherwise. Is is that something that foresters ever do, or is that just people with their own gardens. Uh, Meta, I, I saw last week there was a meta-analysis that came out on this showing that it's, it's, not, worth, uh, it's not worth the effort. Uh, a, large, a large, you know, and this, one, you know, one thing about the, when you think about our, our artificial regeneration, as they call it in forestry versus natural regeneration. Natural re- regeneration is when you encourage a forest to regenerate itself. And then artificial regeneration is when <clears throat> humans help plant. Now, if you look at the survivability of trees that are planted by people, they're usually very, very low, right? Um, Worse than you, natural trees. Yeah. Now, the thing is, is with natural trees, trees, you know, forests, like Dolph was saying, you know, you, we want to think about uh, – you know, not just old trees, but old forests. And when you look at a forest, the way forests work is like per hectare, they're producing hundreds of thousands of seeds. So the way nature works is to really overseed the landscape and then encourage that kind of survival of the fittest. And uh, also, you know, encouraging biodiversity and, you know, whole system dynamics. And if you look at the effort required to restore forests, it's often the case that helping natural regeneration um you know through almost like through good stewardship is often a a very powerful way to to quickly regain uh, the health of forests and the abundance of trees in the landscapes another point i we're talking about the two billion tree program i had a discussion about could there meet their targets with John Riley of the Nature Conservancy, and he said that in order to meet that target, you'd have to use public funds to purchase land for afforestation. And this was done in the past through things like the, uh, you know, agreement forest program, a uh, provincial grants to acquire land by conservation authorities. There aren't programs like this anymore. And I, I thought that was a good suggestion he made to have a, you know, effective uh, a two billion tree program. Well, two billion is only a drop in the bucket, to be honest. I mean, we know that that these guys in Zurich with their estimate that the world has 3 trillion trees now and needs at least 1 trillion more. That means we got to plant a trillion trees, but we have to actually plant maybe two or 3 trillion trees because as Eric points out, there, a lot of them are not going to live. I don't know what the mortality rate is, but if, if one out of three survives, then we have to plant 3 trillion trees in order to get the 1 trillion. Oh, What's the story, you know, I think this but I think this is an important point. I don't believe we need to plant a trillion trees. And I think, I think we, we need another maybe trillion trees on earth, but I think we have to be really careful about, um, you know, how, how much of our approach is going to be artificial regeneration, tree planting versus natural regeneration. And uh, I think most people would agree that the best way is, is natural regeneration and in, in, uh, encouraging forests to naturally regenerate. You know, there was an article in The Guardian just a couple of years ago. They planted 11 million trees. And I don't know how many tens of millions of dollars that costed, but one year later, 90% of them were dead. Right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, so this is the thing is we, we, we often do want these silver bullet solutions like drone planting or whatever and to kind of almost 
uh, to absolve ourselves of the of participating in ecological thinking, right? And and these things just really typically don't don't work as well as forest restoration, right? Because if we restore the health of forests across the whole landscape, we'd be planting hundreds of millions of trees naturally a year. Okay, now that would mean a different kind of approach. And it sounds like it's, it would be relevant to what's going on in Brazil, because we hear, you know, they're burning the rainforest uh, and, and cutting it and so on. And, and the question is, how, what do you do to save existing forests? It sounds like you really have to have new, new kinds of legislation and new ways of compensating the owners or the people who would have some stake in cutting the trees or uh, clearing the land and so on. What are the, the um, procedures that have been developed for legally uh, requiring people to protect trees that are on their land? In Southern Ontario, we have tree cutting bylaws on private land. And we're quite involved with that as uh, a part of the Woodlot Owners Association. And we seem to be able to develop methods and approaches that uh, are satisfactory to the landowners as well as uh, you know to the basic principles of conservation. Um, however, it takes some input and uh, it used to be that government govern, government foresters were available for people to get advice from. Well now uh, you have to pay for it. You have to have a consulting forester or, or timber marker and they will do it for you. Sorry, they will come and tell you which trees you're allowed to cut and which ones yeah, not? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. One of the reasons we have the tree bylaws in Ontario was Zavitt's experience from running the Agreement Forest Program. He, he was concerned, you know, for more forests, not just the planning for its own sake. And one of the things that he, he was shocked to find that when municipalities acquired land under this program, the municipality would allow the landowner to strip all the existing trees on the forest for it, you know, the land was turned over. And that was one of the reasons we have tree bylaws in Ontario. And, the struggle behind them is very complicated. One is now finally being brought into Kent County. I, I did an article on this for the blog of the Sierra Club, encourage people to, to read it. One of the reasons that this happened was quite dramatic. There was to be a, a stand of uh, endangered tree, the uh, American chestnut, to, to be removed and the uh, Ministry of Environment had to send people to the uh, site to uh, you know stop this uh, stop through a stop work order and it created such outrage that Kent County is now very slowly uh, they are adopting now uh, they put an interim tree bylaw in effect immediately and they're slowly developing a permanent bylaw. And this has stopped in uh, Kent County. Uh, this uh, absence of tree bylaws. A group put out a very, you know, moving, you know, video about this. This to to get the bylaw. And there's large parts of Ontario though that still don't have tree bylaws or are very weak bylaws. So uh, one example is Eastern Ontario municipalities. Although there's been a lot of uh, afforestation in uh, the counties of uh, Rus was it, um, Russell, Russell County uh, in Ottawa where the La Rose Forest is, the tree bylaw is so weak the amount of trees, they, they can't get any net increase in forest cover because the, the new, new forests in, in these counties are uh, 
what's lost by private owners is is the same amount. And this was the situation in Norfolk County until the 1950s. One of the reasons that stopped, they had a very dedicated person, Monroe Landon, was the tree bylaw enforcement officer, and he succeeded in getting prosecutions. And it, it shows you how a complex study it purpose its struggle it's been in Ontario to get the successes we've had in, in protecting forests. Okay, I'm a little confused about what Eric has said and what you've just said. It sounds to me as if the idea of protecting forests and allowing them to regenerate is wonderful, but I don't see how that's going to expand the amount of acreage of forests. Uh, I mean, a forest it, it, where, where land has already been cleared for farming, uh, it's not going to regrow a whole new uh, forest by itself, would it? Uh, you're going to have to actually plant new trees there. Well, that's that correct. And, and this is how the 30 million tree program essentially operates at Trudeau Rescue. It's a farmer that has some environmental sensibility. He voluntarily takes part in the what was called the 30 million tree program, and he, he got, you know, seedlings. And often the areas that would be reforested were places that didn't make sense to farm, like near tree streams that would get, you know, flooded if he grew crops and he'd lose money and often hills that were too steep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one important thing to note here is the, uh, uh, the, the province of Ontario has a program called the Managed Forest Tax Incentive Program, an old program that provides uh, tax breaks to farmers who do uh, forest stewardship on their land. And, you know, this is something that's kind of come up a number of times over this discussion is the, the, the approaches to conservation. And uh, if you go onto your map and look at a map of Ontario, you're just going to see farm fields, right? And you look at where the hedgerows are and you look at the back acreage of the woodlots and really helping farmers is really one of the greatest things we can do to achieve sustainability on their farms and work with them to provide incentives to uh, leave larger hedgerows and greater distance around the creeks. And, um, you know, just last uh, week, I had the pleasure of, we have a farm in Terra, Ontario, and uh, the farmer that farms the land around our land is this fellow, Simon DeBoer. And he is a director of the Christian Farmers Foundation, which has 4,000 members in Ontario. And he works with Alice, the Alternative Land Use Systems Group. And there's a lot of groups that are trying to figure out ways to help landowners. And, and, and if you look at the scale of, of uh, you know, the challenge we have with us, like, like John had mentioned, that the forest area is shrinking, right? D due to land use, not just farming, but uh, development, urban development. And um, so that, you know, if we can help really continue and revive these great programs that, that the government has started over the years and, uh, breathe new fresh air into them with the technology that is that is emerging such as drone planting and and really forest inventory and so um, you know we really have a lot of stuff great projects going on and uh, Dolph had mentioned the Ontario Woodlot Association and Forest Ontario and I, I think you know drawing more attention to these great programs and helping to really in, improve the uh, applicability of them across the landscape is, is something we should focus on to a much greater degree. Let me go back for a second to this, the, the preservation of old trees, because I know that is dear to your heart. And I think dear to mine too, just for sentimental reasons. Uh, I, I remember seeing a, a stump of a tree that was like 10 feet across in diameter, you know, and, 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 and somebody saying this was cut to make toilet paper or something, you know, it's just, it breaks your heart to think of a thing like that. So, uh, but there's a whole tendency among uh, the people who are working on uh, global warming and trying to prevent climate change, uh, say that what we need is to use mass timber 
instead of concrete, because concrete it emits a lot of uh, C carbon to the atmosphere when in, in producing it. And so they want to replace a lot of structures with or create new structures using timber. Uh, so that means cutting down old trees and uh, replacing them with new ones. Now, I don't understand the economics of that, if you will. Um, how, how much do we want to just maintain old trees, either for sentimental reasons or because they actually continue to be reservoirs for storage of, of carbon and that we don't want to lose? Uh, does it make economic or uh, logical sense to cut down big trees and use them to build uh, high-rise buildings now um, and then replace them with, with little ones? Well, you know, the devil's in the details on any of these things. And I, I think, um, you know, it's not just old trees, but again, like Dolphin said, it's old forests. And if you, you can make mass timber out of, out of a lot of things, not just old trees. And uh, so you, you're, you, you've got to weigh this out because if there's a lot of wood, for instance, that gets cut down in, in, uh, in urban areas, you know, millions of board feet that gets ground up into wood chips. And so... Yeah, I think we have to be really careful. That's another kind of way of looking at, uh, you know, like a quick fix, right? I think mass timber has a lot of, you know, great applications and it's a wonderful way to use wood. But if you're not looking at the source of that wood, and if that wood is coming from large old contiguous forests that have a, a real value across the landscape, then we could be cutting ourselves, you know, two times. And so it, it's something that... Uh, I, I, I'm a little skeptical about myself. Really, the trees are uh, uh, the best way of, for us uh, to get the carbon out of the air and, and stabilize it. And if we can use it, particularly on a continuing basis, I think that's the cycle that we should be working on. This mass timber seems to be uh, where we ought to be going from what I can see other than, you know, leaving, leaving old trees uh, for ecological reasons. Uh, we, should be getting, we, we should get the seed from those uh, superior producing trees, which has, means also trees that are effectively uh, taking carbon out of the air and putting it into mass timber, if you like. Um, and so we can make progress in, in two ways. We're using less um to build facilities instead of um, uh, spewing a lot of carbon into the air by making concrete we are taking air carbon out of the air by using mass timber so i think the basic equation is a very promising one uh yes and, and well but look when you cut down a tree you're actually participating in deforestation so every time you cut no, down a no. tree aren't you just reducing the amount of trees in the if, world if, if or, i can if, if, if i can all right uh, oh, John. for mass timber you don't have to cut old trees a, a, a company involved in mass trees is in um think they're in the St. Thomas area. Yep. They're creating a forest for the purpose of mass trees. And that area in St. Thomas is one of the worst deforested areas in all of Canada. I was sort of delighted to see that this company is having reforestation in exactly the area that's needed. And to, to have these uh, mass timber that for uh, ecologically sustainable purposes, the there is a threat to old growth trees in Ontario. It's not from commercial logging. It it's the threats are like maybe under not undermanaged uh, land that's owned by uh, conservancies that 
if you, uh, Eric's probably familiar with that. Parts of Toronto that have old growth forests publicly owned that it's not properly cared for. There's a lot of, you know, trampling in, in the forest and soil damage and this sort of thing. Often these areas don't have, you know, proper trails. Also, there's old growth forests uh, threatened by real estate development. This is my in involvement in, in Thundering Waters. A lot of the, the forests there are old growth trees, and what is protecting them is essentially the wetland policy of Ontario, which the Ford government is continually trying to undermine. You know, the way, the way I'm growing these trees now is I'm, I'm using, you know, the seeds from these old growth trees, so they have very high-quality genetics. They're locally adapted to the environment. And these trees, uh, you know, some of the, the, the work that uh, Dolph and John have mentioned here about the initial, you know, reforestation programs in Ontario, they, they used to call old growth trees plus trees. When you find a, a big old tree that has a real strong, good quality growing structure to it, uh, we've, we've long known that we want to get good quality genes for reforestation, but that's just the first step. The second step is germinating those seeds in a way that produces a really good root, a really good little radical. And then making sure that that's growing in a really good propagation tray that produces a strong root structure. And then going through a series of steps that are very simple, but just like anything, if you miss a step, it's kind of like a math, math equation, you end up with a poor quality tree. So you're gonna, you know, it gets back to education. You, could, you can give kids uh, high quality tree seeds, but if there's not a, a program to grow them. Uh, so, We've been working with schools in Toronto to develop programs that integrate their curriculum, you know, ways in which they can, they can sub in trees and local biodiversity to understand more about biology and, and forestry. And, um, and, you know, and even bring science, uh, you know, in, into the, the growing of this and evaluate how trees are growing over time and, and the survivability. If you were giving advice to uh, Trudeau about how to improve our forests and, and increase them uh, as rapidly as possible. John, what would your uh, well, one-liner be? Forests in the uh, um, western part of Toronto are healthier than in the eastern part. It's because the black walnut has become a dominant species there. It's a, a tree that is, was almost wiped out and uh, it's very good at combating the, uh, the this uh, invasive dog strangling vine, which in the uh, eastern part of Toronto, like the Rouge Park, is you know preventing trees to re regenerate. And I I think if the walnut was encouraged to uh, you know grow in in these areas where the this uh, infestation of this exotic uh, uh, plant, it would be a way of uh, a part of a strategy of dealing with uh, the, the forest problems we have in, in, in Toronto. So I want to take the opportunity to get that idea out there now. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Don, yeah, what's your final word to, of, of wisdom to Justin Trudeau? Um, well, I I really can't say that uh, I can speak because he has to think in in Canadian terms. He has to be able to his program will pro has to be different in Newfoundland than it has to be in 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 British Columbia and Ontario is in between. And we have many regions in Ontario. It's different if you're working in Crown land totally different than on private land. So uh, it's it's an enormous program. If he wants to have a national tree planting program, I'd love to see it. But we have all kinds of na programs in the provinces. Let's pull them together and make them more effective and try and, and, and put some money into it. This is when Ontario thrived, when we were getting federal governments because our provincial government got something for nothing, 
and they love that. So they were behind it too. Okay, this has been wonderful, very enlightening, and I want to thank all of you. And uh, I, I, I hope everybody's going to go out and plant a tree and protect the ones that we already have. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, Bye-bye.